Okay, so um, we now record our thing. Um, and, okay, so that's why I was just. Oh, you. Know. Yeah. So um, it's right here, but it's not visual. It's just audio. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. We thought about it. I mean, 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 we thought about it
She'll be giving us an update on infections with MDROs, one of our favorite topics, <laughs> with our yellow gowns and whatnot. So, Dr. Ron, thank you for coming today. No problem. All right. So, I have full disclosures. Um, due to issues with resistance, I'm going to be talking about some non FDA approved indications of some antibiotics. Um, and I am a transplant ID doc. Thank you, Andrew, for mentioning that. So, most of my cases do come from that service. So I wish I had good news to share on this topic. Um, I unfortunately don't. Antibiotic resistance has really accelerated rapidly over the last decade to the point where we have a pandemic of MDR pathogens with very few drugs in the R&D pipeline. And this is a current state of crisis that is recognized nationally and internationally. In fact, some of you may recall that in 2014, President Obama issued an executive order asking the government to look at combating antimicrobial resistance. And these are the numbers. There's about 2 million <laughs> illnesses a year due to antimicrobial resistance and 23,000 deaths. And so you may be asking, or you probably already know, how does antimicrobial resistance spread? So I like this slide from the CDC. It says, simply using antibiotics creates resistance. These drugs should only be used to treat infections. So here, oh, let me go back. So here we have antibiotics. And many of you may know that they're not only given to humans, but they're actually used in the food animal industry. Um, and so animals get antibiotics that create resistance bacteria in their guts, and then that subsequently moves up the food chain or goes through fertilizer or water, um, and then subsequently spreads that way. And then, of course, we use antibiotics in humans, leading to development of resistance bacteria in the gut. And then this can subsequently spread to other individuals, either through our own hands or through hospital surfaces. Yes? There's a lot of unnecessary um, antibiotics. I don't remember the exact number. I've seen it. Um, it's not coming to me on top of my head, but I can get, I don't know if there's like a way to specifically quantify it, but it is a large proportion of it, and they feel like there's more research being done in this particular area, yeah. So these are the organisms that have escaped the effects of what we use as traditional antimicrobials, so Enterococcus faecium, Staph aureus, Clostridium difficile, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacteriaceae. I'm going to talk today about Enterococcus faecium, Staph aureus, Enterobacteriaceae, and touch on Pseudomonas. Definitions are really important to get on the same page. So, multi-drug resistant bacteria are non-susceptible to three or more classes of antimicrobials. Extensively drug resistant bacteria are non-susceptibility to all but one or two classes of antimicrobials. And pan-drug resistant bacteria are not susceptible to all agents and all antimicrobial classes. So let's start with a case. This is a 75-year-old man from Ecuador with end-stage renal disease, status post a kidney transplant in 2009. He has diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, and diabetic foot ulcers. He's recently had osteo. 
and he also has enterococcal endocarditis with an aortic valve replacement. He's now presenting with fevers and shaking chills. He's ill-appearing and lethargic. He has a murmur, by Bezler-Rowles, and no obvious ulcers, but some excoriations are noted, and no skin stigmata of infective endocarditis. His white count is 21. And not surprise, he grows MRSA. We know that this is MRSA because we look at the oxacillin here, which says resistant, so this tells us this is staph aureus that's oxacillin resistant or MRSA. So he started on vancomycin. The MRI of the left foot suggests osteomyelitis as a potential source. TTE and TEE are negative for vegetations. And on hospital day seven, he switched to daptomycin after one week of bacteremia. So let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology. So staph aureus is a common colonizer of the nares and skin, and it typically causes infection when there's a breach of mucosal barriers or skin. So that's why a lot of times we'll see line infections, for example. It's a common cause of osteomyelitis, endocarditis, skin and soft tissue infection, and other hospital onset infections, and when compared to MSSA, it's associated with overall longer median duration of hospital stay, increased hospital costs, and higher mortality rates. So I want to point out this graph because you can actually see that the overall incidence of MRSA has actually decreased over time. And significantly, if you look at the gray, oh, where'd my mouse go? Um, this is actually hospital-acquired infections you can see that MRSA hospital-acquired infections has significantly decreased over time. This is the community-acquired infections, which has stayed stable, um, which is interesting, but really the differentiation between community-acquired and hospital-acquired has become sort of blurred over time because these community-acquired cases enter our hospital, and then these strains enter the healthcare system and then cause HAIs. Um, so overall, MRSA does account for still a substantial portion of HAIs, but we have actually seen somewhat of a decrease. It doesn't necessarily feel like that, but actually um, we have seen somewhat of a decrease. So what about treatment? So treatment involves appropriate antimicrobial therapy along with source control. So if there's a line infection, you need to pull it. If there's an abscess, it needs to be debrided. We talk with our fellows a lot about determining the extent of the infection and the source. So taking a careful history and a physical is really important. You know, palpating over the spine to make sure there's no pinpoint tenderness to rule out epidural abscess. All of those things are really important in a patient with MRSA. Prolonged fever, blood cultures that are positive for 96 hours, community acquisition of infection or skin examination suggestive of systemic infection, are independent predictors of clinical complications and metastatic disease with MRSA. And we treat these patients typically for four to six weeks. And why do we do that? It's because there's such a high risk of metastatic disease with MRSA that we give prolonged treatment. Two weeks of therapy can be done in certain situations. I will tell you none of my patients ever fall into this category, but the people who can get two weeks of therapy are people who have a negative TEE, who have no prosthetic um, um, joints or any prostheses. They've cleared the bacteremia very, very quickly, and they've defervesced very quickly, and there's no evidence of metastatic site of infection. So in a patient who maybe had a peripheral IV, who's not otherwise immunocompromised, who cleared very quickly and has a negative TEE, that may be the candidate that gets two weeks. So the mainstay of treatment for MRSA is still vancomycin. Um, it's a glycopeptide that inhibits cell wall synthesis, and really the IDSA guidelines recommend that when the MIC, or the minimum inhibitory concentration, is less than two, to use vancomycin up front. Um, what is this MIC creep that you may hear us, some of us talk about? So when the MIC is high in certain situations, or sometimes when patients are receiving vancomycin, you'll see the MIC start to go up. In some studies, this has been associated with increased treatment failure and mortality. Um, and so that's why you'll hear sometimes some people say, oh, well, the MIC is high, I'm gonna try an alternative agent. However, there was a recent meta-analysis that looked at 800 patients 
that failed to confirm any difference in mortality between those with the high vancomycin MIC and those with the low vanco MIC. So I think there's gonna be more to come on this, but I think in general, the more recent data suggests that having a higher MIC probably doesn't make a difference um, in mortality at least, and that most people in these situations do still use vancomycin upfront for the treatment of MRSA infections. PK and PD dosing is important, as you all know, to achieve adequate exposure to vancomycin with troughs aiming between 15 to 20 for serious infections um, or an AUC MIC greater than 400. Daptomycin is the only other drug that's approved for treatment of bacteremia and right-sided endocarditis. Um, if you're treating pneumonia, don't use it because it's inactivated by surfactant. The IDSA guidelines recommend considering higher doses for complicated or severe infections. And this is a theme that we're gonna keep talking about with daptomycin. Um, interestingly, with daptomycin, when patients have received a lot of vancomycin, and some of them do have that MIC creep on vancomycin that we see, those patients are unfortunately also the same ones who are at risk for developing daptomycin resistance. And we don't really have a clear understanding why, but we do know that those patients who have higher MIC creep with Vanco will also tend to eventually develop daptomycin resistance. Side effects of dapto include myopathy, rapto, and rarely eosinophilic pneumonia. What about linazolid? Um, so we tend to reserve linazolid for short courses and for patients who have skin and soft tissue infection or pneumonia. This is a clinical trial that looked at linazolid versus vancomycin. Um, and showed that there was improved clinical and microbiological response when treated for use for HAP, um, although mortality in this study was similar. And because linazolid is orally bioavailable, that's why we tend to use it for these short courses um, and for patients who are outpatients who have an MRSA, skin and soft tissue infection, or for example, if you need like a five or seven day course for a HAP. Um, it's limited, obviously, by myelosuppression, but the myelosuppression with linazolid tends to develop after a week or two of treatment. Side effects also include peripheral neuropathy, optic neuritis, lactic acidosis, and serotonin syndrome when co-administered with other SSRIs. Ceftaroline is a new drug. This is a fifth generation cephalosporin with activity against MRSA, VISA, and GNRs also. It's approved for skin and soft tissue infection and community acquired pneumonia. Has been used in some cases for bacteremia and in some salvage um, cases with combination therapy with daptomycin. So, this was a study that, a cohort study that basically looked at 26 patients at 10 medical centers where they added the ceftaroline to daptomycin after a patient had been bacteremic on average for 10 days. And they found that the average time to clearance after the addition of combination therapy was two days. Um, and you can see here that this is the killing um, time curves and that the killing time was most enhanced in this daptomycin ceftaroline combination. So our patient did get ceftaroline plus daptomycin um, blood culture is cleared about four days later, and eventually this patient got discharged to hospice. But I thought this was an interesting case to sort of talk about treatment for MRSA bacteremia. Any questions about MRSA? Okay. So I think there'll be more to come on combination therapy for MRSA in the literature. Let's see. So case two, this is a 37-year-old woman with decompensated hep C cirrhosis with a history of SVP, colodocalithiasis, status post ERCP and biliary stent placement, and she's admitted for a liver transplant. She's not feeling so great though, so they draw some blood cultures. And these grow VRE VCM. So the liver transplant's canceled. She started on daptomycin, eight mg per keg IV daily for bacteremia. And they don't want to use, the liver team requests, please don't use linazolid because we're really worried about her thrombocytopenia. What do you guys think about that? Okay. 
Yeah, the thrombocytopenia develops after a week, like I pointed out. So it's really something that becomes a concern after a week or two on therapy, not initially up front. The dose is increased to 12 mg per keg IV daily for persistent bacteremia. She gets a TE that's negative. Five days later, she's still bacteremic. So finally, they get an ERCP. And not a surprise, the ERCP does have an obstruction, and there's a stent that's placed. So I come in, I'm on call on a Saturday, um, and I get a phone call. She's complaining of muscle pain in her shoulder and her arm. So I go to see her. She has definite tenderness on exam. They do a CPK, and it's elevated at 307. The next day, the myalgias worsen, um, and the CPK is now 775. Now what? So what's that from? Yeah, that's from the DAPTO. Um, and so we changed her to linazolid. So BRE is a gram-positive organism that frequently causes GI and GU infection. Um, and BRE really came onto the horizon in the early 90s. Um, and it, you can see that it increased from the late 80s to the 90s, most dramatically in ICU patients, actually. And vancomycin resistance among all enterococcus approaches around 30% in the U.S., but enterococcus specium is really where we see the most vancomycin resistance. Enterococcus specium isolates have about 80% vancomycin resistance, and that is true for this hospital. Um, mortality rates associated with VRE range from 26 to 40%. And it's not because enterococcus tends to be a la less pathogenic organism. It's probably more because of what it comes with. So it tends to be seen in patients who've been in the hospital, who've been in the ICU, who have lots of comorbidities, and who've seen a lot of antibiotics. Yep. I'm not talking about infection control because that's like a whole other <laughs> hour-long lecture. I mean, so I can definitely find someone to give you that talk. I mean, I've done infection prevention control in a previous life until a year ago, but you know, I mean, I, I so definitely we can talk about that. Um, we are no longer doing it, if that's your question. Yeah, um, and the reason probably is. Um, because the reality is we see a lot of MRSA and a lot of ERE, and we have better drugs for these. Um, and so we are no longer really, and there's more out in the, more data in the literature to suggest that um, the wearing of gown and gloves for these pathogens is not necessarily preventive of transmission. So nowadays we're doing more molecular data. Um, and back like 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have molecular data. And the molecular data seems to suggest that there's not as much transmission in the hospital as we thought there was necessarily. Um, and that there's also more literature suggesting that contact precautions inhibits good patient care. Um, so I think that played a role into all the decisions. But welcome to talk to Gopi if you want to. Um, or I'm happy to. Um, there's definitely people who could give you that talk for sure. Um, um, but that's. Uh, that all went into the rationale. We still do um, isolate liver transplant candidates and transplant recipients with BRE um, because this organism is very prevalent in the um, transplant population. So I like this slide. Um, it talks about the walk of enterococci towards antibiotic resistance. So you can see that um, the use of antimicrobials really played a role in the development of BRE. So we know that patients who are exposed to vanco, patients who receive third-generation cephalosporins, and patients who receive metronidazole are at risk for developing BRE infection. So back to some, um, Andrew, what you were asking about, this is a growth. Um, this is an antibiotic that was used in food animals in Europe. It's a glycopeptide. Um, and actually, in Europe, this seems to be really linked to the development of VRE isolates there. Um, and they've actually stopped using it. Um, so there's definitely research out there showing that there is contribution of some antibiotics in the food animal industry to resistance. So moving on to treatment. So previously, old, the, uh, the older sort of meta-analysis suggested that linazolid was probably 
better associated with clinical outcomes when compared to DAPTO for VRE. But some more recent literature seems to suggest that those studies may have used suboptimal dosing strategies for daptomycin. So there was a recent VA national retrospective cohort study looking at 900 patients who were treated with high-dose DAPTO, medium-dose, and low-dose DAPTO, and the high-dose DAPTO patients used to, seemed to have better survival. Interestingly, in this study, there was no difference in the CPK elevation observed in the three treatment arms. So this is the Kaplan-Meier curve from this study. You can see that the higher um, dose stepto was associated with better survival when compared to standard and medium dose. Interestingly, I like to point out that in the study, infectious disease consultation was also associated with improved survival. Um, and this is a study looking at, um, this is just from down the street, this is Mini Cambodge at um, Sloan Kettering, who basically showed that as the increase of daptomycin, um, as the use of daptomycin increased at their hospital, which are these bars, the um, emergence of non-daptomycin susceptible VRE also went up. Um, so we definitely have been seeing um, non-daptomycin susceptible VRE, as well as Linase lid resistance in these isolates that seems to correlate with the use of more of these newer agents. So back to our patient, um, she was changed to Linase lid on day seven of Bacteremia, but that ended up being the last positive day of her cultures. So she probably did clear on that high dose daptomycin. Her CPK, I think, peaked at like 4,000 before it came down. Um, so, you know, she probably could have gotten Linazola too up front and been okay. Um, but I think there's sort of more to come on VRE and high dose daptomycin. She's still awaiting a liver transplant. So, I'm going to switch gears and talk about MDR gram negative infections. So, MDR gram negative infections account for a large portion of morbidity and mortality in the U.S. Um, you guys are all familiar with ESBLs. I'm not going to talk about ESBLs today. I'm going to focus on CRE at two moments. So gram-negative resistance mechanisms. So loss of porins are the most one of the most common ways that resistance can develop. Um, overexpression of efflex pumps, so the antibiotic being pumped out. So either the antibiotic can't get can't get in, or the antibiotic gets pumped out. That's one of the most common ways that resistance develops. Or beta-lactamases are also very common, and beta-lactamases hydrolyze the beta-lactam ring. So the beta-lactamases are grouped by molecular classification. And the most common beta-lactamase that we see are in this Ambler class A. And we typically see ESBLs, which are the TEM and CHEV class, but we also see KPC in the U.S., which is Klebsiella producing carbapenemase. So CRE is recognized by the CDC as an urgent level threat. It accounts for 9,000 drug-resistant infections a year and 600 deaths. And as you can see, they say that CRE has become nearly resistant to all or nearly all available antibiotics. CRE was first recognized in 2001 in a patient from North Carolina. It's been an increasing cause of HAIs in the U.S. from 1.2% in 2001 to 4.2% of all infections in 2011. Most of these infections are seen in Klebsiella species, and again, the most frequently seen carbapenemase that we see is the KPC carbapenemase. And as you can see, in New York, we really sit in the hotbed of CRKP. Um, this is where the epidemic really started back in 2005, 2006, and subsequently spread all over the U.S. And why do we in ID talk about CRE so much? Um, it's really because of the mortality associated with CRE. So this is data out of our own institution. This is looking at liver transplant recipients who develop CRKP infection. And out of 14 recipients who developed CRKP infection, 10 of them died. And this goes, this is probably 
around average for most studies, which show about a 40% to a 70% mortality rate associated with CRE. What are the risk factors associated with CRE? So this is, again, another study out of our own institution looking at case patients with CRE and comparing it to patients who didn't. You can see that in the multivariable analysis, transplant was an independent risk factor for infection with CRE. Mechanical ventilation was an independent risk factor for CRE. Length of stay, as well as the use of certain antibiotics. So you can see that these patients also tend to be hospitalized patients receiving antibiotics and critical care, and that tends to be risk factors associated with carbapenem-resistant infection. So case three, this is a 52-year-old man who's gotten three liver transplants, and he's up for another for a liver and a kidney. Not surprisingly, he's colonized with this in the urine. So what is this? This is CRKP, right? So this is carbapenem-resistant Klebsiella. How do we know that? Well, it's imipenem-resistant and ertapenem-resistant. And not surprisingly, it's susceptible to only gentamicin, tegacyclin, and polymyxin or colistin. Okay? So we don't treat this until he goes for transplant. And then when he goes for transplant, he gets perioperative prophylaxis with tigacycline to cover this. Post-step day five, though, you get called. He's febrile, he's hypotensive, he's having increased tracheal secretions. The team sends off blood and sputum cultures. And you are asked, what do I give this patient? Do you want to start gentamicin? Do you want to start colistin? Do you want to start septaz avibactin? Or should we just all, you know, draw straws? Okay. So the, this, is, this is a tough case. So, and this is what grows. So not surprisingly, this Klebsiella is now intermediate to resistant to tigacycline. That's what he was on. Um, still susceptible to colistin and still susceptible to gent. So this patient actually got septaz avibactin. I'm going to talk about all these drugs. Okay. So. This is traditionally the drugs that we had to use to treat CRKP. So, and I'm going to touch on all of these. So, tigacycline is FDA approved for complicated intra-abdominal infections, <coughs> pneumonia, and skin and soft tissue infection. Of note, it's not really used that much for bloodstream infections because it's really hard to get good serum levels with this drug. Um, and it's not used for UTIs because of given poor concentration in the urine. Um, having said that, I have used this drug to treat both of those things, so sometimes we just don't really have a choice, but, um, you know, it is important to recognize that it achieves good levels in the belly, good levels in the lungs, good levels in the skin, but not so much in the blood and the urine. FDA issued a mortality warning in 2010 with this drug, but this has really not borne out in subsequent meta-analyses. Tegacycline resistance is increasing, as we just saw in this previous patient. And overall, it has a favorable side effect profile. It, it, some patients complain of nausea vomiting, but most patients tolerate it pretty well. So what's colistin and polymyxin B? These are old drugs that have really been brought back um, for the treatment of CRE. Um, so colistin is polymyxin E. It differs from polymyxin B by single amino acid. Um, and depending on where you have trained, you may have seen both drugs or one or the other being used. Um, there's more recent literature to suggest that polymyxin B has some advantages. And specifically, both drugs are associated with nephrotoxicity, but it appears that there may be less nephrotoxicity um, with polymyxin B. Neurotoxicity <coughs> is also a concern, but that's sort of reported less frequently with current formulations. And these drugs are very complex to dose. I always have to call my pharmacist when I dose these drugs, and the literature is ever-changing on how to dose them. So this is the meta-analysis looking at the nephrotoxicity. You can see that there was more nephrotoxicity against colistin. 
So based on some of this recent data, we used to have colistin on formulary here. We've actually added polymyxin B and have gone back to using polymyxin B for some of these infections um, because of some of this recent data with colistin. What about combination therapy? Combination therapy has been shown in some studies to decrease mortality when compared with monotherapy. It can be considered as part of empiric treatment to optimize regimen in severe infections with CRE, especially when combining with carbapenems. This is a recent study. This is the Increment Multicenter Cohort Study. Um, looked at 26 hospitals in 10 countries. It enrolled 480 patients with bloodstream infection secondary to CRE. Appropriate empiric therapy was associated with lower mortality rate compared to inappropriate empiric therapy. Not a surprise. Among those receiving appropriate therapy, though, mortality was not different between combination and monotherapy unless they were in the higher mortality score stratum. So what does that mean? That means in the patients who were really, really sick and critically ill, there did seem to be a benefit to giving um, combination therapy up front. The study didn't collect information though, about source control, and source control is still really important in these patients. So again, this is our data from our institution showing that antibiotics really didn't matter. What mattered? Adjunctive therapy. And what was adjunctive therapy? You pull the line, you debrided the abscess, whatever. So taking care of the source is really what seems to make it different. And this goes along with all MDRO infections. So I've given you a lot of bad news. Um, is there any good news? So yay, we have a new drug. It's called Ceftaz Avibactam. It's a novel cephalosporin beta lactamase inhibitor combination. It was FDA approved in 2015 for complicated UTIs and intra-abdominal infections. Um, and I spent some time talking to you about the beta lactamases earlier on because it's important to understand that these newer drugs are active against certain beta lactamases, but not all of them. So this particular one has activity against KPC. There was a multi-center retrospective review of patients who received Ceftaz Abbey at nine different health systems. The in-hospital mortality rate was 32%, and there was no difference between Ceftaz Abbey monotherapy and combination therapy. Notably, there was already some resistance developing, although this is a new drug. This was a study looking at 109 patients out of Pittsburgh, and you can see there was significantly improved clinical success with the use of Ceftaz Avi when compared to carbapenem plus immunoglycoside or carbapenem plus colistin or other. So I think Ceftaz Avi is a promising new drug for the use of infections with CRKP. So case four, this is a 23-year-old man who had a LVAD that was placed one year ago, and he develops a device infection. He's listed to undergo heart transplant. So let's look at his pseudomonas. Um, this is actually, the reason it's like this is because this patient was sent here from Israel, um, and this is the culture that we got before he came. So you can see that this is susceptible only to the aminoglycosides and only susceptible to colistin. It's resistant to everything else. So this is an XDR pseudomonas. And MDR, XDR pseudomonas um, does account for a significant portion of infection in hospitalized patients. This was a study that showed that 22% of pneumonia and 14% of bloodstream infections between 2000 and 2009 in hospitalized patients was due to MDR pseudomonas. And in this particular study, the rates of MDR pseudomonas were higher than CRE. And the rates of MDR pseudomonas do seem to be increasing um, over time at an alarming pace. So what did this patient get? This patient got another new drug that's on the market um, for this particular type of bacteria. It's called Septolazone Tazobactam. Again, this drug is a combination beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor. It was approved for treatment of complicated intra-abdominal infections and complicated UTIs. Um, it was compared to meropenem and achieved non-inferiority, and that's how it was FDA approved. Um, it's being evaluated as part of a phase three clinical trial for nosocomial pneumonia. Um, it basically comprises the anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin ceftolazone, 
which has very good activity against pseudomonas and stability against some of the several resistance mechanisms in that organism that we talked about, like the foreign mutations and the efflux pumps. Um, the tazobactam extends the activity of the septolazone against some of those other beta-lactamases, but it's less potent against ESBL or KPC producing gram negatives when compared to septaz AVI. So that patient got septolazone, tazobactam, ended up getting a heart transplant and then actually didn't do well and subsequently um, um, expired, but probably due to other reasons. So um, I, I'm going to check very just a few slides on this because, like I said, this is a whole other hour. Um, but antimicrobial stewardship is obviously very, very important um, to prevent um, development of resistance. And in, you know, the, our real goal is that in cases like this, when you have severe infections and sepsis, do give the broad spectrum antibiotics up front. That's really important. And time and time again, studies have shown that appropriate empiric therapy is important. Um, but you know, once the cultures come back and if they're negative, it's important to de-escalate therapy as soon as possible and provide short durations of therapy. And I think you can see why, from our perspective, we see patients with these severe MDRO infections. And so we really try to minimize the use of inappropriate antibiotics for that reason. And you can even see that in the use of these recently approved antimicrobials that I talked about today, there's already resistance that has been reported. Infection prevention, although I'm not going to talk much about it, is very important. Um, and for CRE and the MDR, XDR pseudomonas, those patients are still, um, it's still important to, we still do isolate those patients. Um, and that's based on CDC guidance. So it's important to know if you have a patient with a carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae infection. Um, those patients should be placed in contact precautions with dedicated equipment. Um, it's hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene is super, super important when taking care of these patients, um, probably more important than the gown and gloves. Um, it's really important that if you do, are receiving a patient, like from an LCTF, for example, an LTAG that has CRE, um, that you notify infection prevention and control. Um, and um, Obviously, prescribe and use antibiotics wisely and discontinue devices like urinary catheters as soon as necessary. This is from the CDC. And that's it. Any questions? It's kind of a whirlwind of MDROs, um, but some of the newer literature that's on this topic and also may explain to you some of what you see the ID consult attendants do on some of your patients. <laughs> We're coming back to infection control. Um, yes, yes, yes. Is that what your question was? Are they all killed by bleach or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those things are all cleaned by bleach. Um, it, when you have a pan, it sounds like it was a pan-resistant isolate. So they were probably being extra careful, maybe, about what was going on. Oh. Yeah. Right. So if you have any of those cases, I you should talk to infection prevention and control and get them involved. They're probably already aware and doing a lot of stuff in the background that you may not realize. So it's really important to just speak with them. Some of the stuff about going in the room and not coming out, um, that's with Canada Oris specifically, which is totally different. Um, 
So yeah, these things are cleaned by bleach. There's a lot of new um, environmental cleaning techniques out there for MDR organisms, including UV light and things like that. So again, um, you know, it's I think it's really you should each unit has an infection prevention nurse who's like assigned to that unit. You should know who that person is and um, give them a call if you have specific questions about that. Um, Sarah Schaefer and Gopi are the two hospital epidemiologists here. You're always welcome, I think, to reach out to them too if you have questions. But um, um, I, I say that because I don't know how, sometimes things get passed in hearsay, you know, a lot of times, you know, and so I don't know sometimes what's really, that's why I say if you just reach out to the real person, then you may get the most accurate information. Yeah. 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 Yep. 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 Um. Yeah, so I, I can go back to the slide that showed sort of the risk factors. So yes, we were we were the epicenter of the CRE epidemic. So we've been seeing this a long, long time. Um, and so you can see here again, this study is from our own institution in 2008. Um, and um, the risk factors, so carbapenem use was significantly associated with the development of CRE, as was other antimicrobials. So, um, you know, we reserve carbapenems for when they're necessary. We don't like to use them up front unless there's an ESBL or something like that, someone's colonized with, or someone's severely ill. Um, so that's, yeah, so we don't use ertapenem here up front unless there's a reason to use ertapenem. Yes. Yeah. Fully resistant, not fully sensitive. Yeah. Um, you know, often we'll choose something that it is sensitive to, but I feel like there are certain situations yep. where I can see teams be sort of skeptical in some of those situations that mm -hmm. things are truly sensitive to what they say they are. Yeah. Are there certain just pearls? Of yeah, there are. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to come back and talk more about that. Um, <laughs> there, there are, there are. Um, so, and, and, and that's what ID training is about, is learning to um, recognize um, what makes sense and, and what doesn't. So when should we reach out for the, when should we reach you out You can always, if you're not sure about something, you can always call the ID fellow um, or call the AO attending, right, and have them look at culture and say, you know, I'm looking at this, does this, does using this antimicrobial make sense or not? So most of the time, I will say those things are kind of caught off the back end. So I'll, I'll give you a common example, ESBLs, right? Um, so it, it should say, and I didn't talk about ESBLs, and I can do that at another time, but ESBLs, um, it says at the top, right, this is an ESBL. And the drug of choice for an ESBL is a carbapenem typically, but it will say susceptible to Sosin, for example. Um, and why is that? Well, there is some in vitro susceptibility to those other agents, um, but the literature supports that if you have a patient who's severely ill or sick with an ESBL infection, you do want to give a carbapenem up front. So not to say that you may be able to get away with using Sosin, but if you have a patient who is sick, really the best drug of choice in that situation is a carbapenem. Um, cefepime is another one where we will use cefepime here for ESBLs if the MIC is low. You can go to another institution and they will not use cefepime for an ESBL at all because the data is in support of basically using carbapenems in these situations. So that's probably why you may be hearing sort of different things that that's, I mean, I'm just guessing, but that may, that's usually the most common example where people have some confusion is, is with an ESBL infection. And, and if you have an ESBL infection that you're treating, it's totally appropriate to call ID um, and, and speak to someone about it. Um, 
So yeah, we I think we don't expect that you manage patients with MDRO infections on your own. Um, and you know, and I think I pointed out to you before that in that in that study with the VRE um, ID consultation and in other studies too has been shown to be helpful. So you know, call us. <laughs> call us. Um, uh, obviously, the antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists too. I'll plug them, and they know all of these things too, and all these resist. They're all they're all very well versed, um, um, even maybe more than the IE fellows in some of these difficult cases because they've been doing this for a long, long time, and so they can easily look at your um, pattern and recommend the appropriate antibiotic. And that's and that's why they're here. That's why we have an antimicrobial stewardship 